Tonight we are talking about shutter speeds. Last month we talked about apertures and of course those two settings on the camera of all the possible settings you can make are probably the most important. Everything else really leads you towards the choices that you make of your aperture and your shutter speed. So we've dealt with apertures to a certain extent. There's a little more to say about them, but I'm gonna come back to that in a future webinar. Let's now focus on shutter speeds and why they are important, what they're for, how to control them and how to uh, make the choices to get the result that you expect. So I'm just gonna flick over to my keynote um, with the title shutter speed up there. And where to start with one? First of all, well, what, what, what do actually shutter speeds, what do they look like? Well, here's, here's an image of uh, the top of an M9. Um, that's an M240, I think it is. I've got an M9 here. Just most cameras will have on the top some sort of dial, somewhere on it, some sort of dial. It may not be actually labeled. The SL2 doesn't have a label on the dial because it's a multifunction dial. Other cameras, you have to go into the menus, but somewhere there will be a choice of shutter speed. And the shutter speed is the time for which the sensor is exposed to the light. So in sort of slow motion, that sort of the light's coming through the lens and the shutter's closed and then the shutter gets out of the way, the light falls on the sensor and then the shutter closes again and there's no more light. And during that time, the sensor is absorbing that light and building up a signal and that's what the exposure is. Now, the duration of that time is critical. It could be long, could be short, but what do I even mean by long and short? Well, let's, let's need to quantify that, don't we? Because the, the specific time that you set your exposure to, the shutter speed to, is of course absolutely critical. So um, you'll also notice that there's a sequence of numbers on that dial, which is very much standardized, and it's not precisely what you might expect. So just as a little little digression, you may notice on that dial, I'm looking at it on my screen right in front of me, it goes one, two, four, eight, then it goes to 15. It doesn't double, does it? And then it goes to 16, then 125, not 120. And some of the older cameras, um, I don't have one to hand, but my Leica 3 has, um, I think it's 10, 20, 40, and 80 eight as a fraction of a second. So it's it's, a little bit different. But the reason that that sequence isn't in doubling is simply because it's easier to read and easier to do the mental maths. It's it's rounding, that's all it is. So 8, 15, 30, 60, 125, 125, 250, 1,000, sorry, 500, 1,000, they're nice round numbers. And if you actually do the math on them, you'll find that the variation between the shutter speed on the dial um, is and what the theoretical shutter speed is is actually quite small but more importantly and this is the key thing the camera gives you the correct shutter speed so when you set a 15th of a second you're really getting a 16th of a second the shutter of the camera is set to operate in multiples of two exactly like apertures are so you always get that equivalence of aperture and shutter speed changing even though the number on the dial is slightly different so there's a little bit of tricky stuff going on under the hood all right we, let's quantify so a high shutter speed is the same word, well, the same meaning as a fast shutter speed and a quick, short, whatever. But it means is that the exposure is so brief that anything that's moving will, will not have had time to move during the exposure and will, re, will be recorded as a sharp dot. So a single dot that's moving with a very short exposure will be recorded as a single dot. Okay, that's what a short exposure is. Um, I'm gonna come back a little bit to what I mean by fast high shutter speeds and long slow shutter speeds in a sec in terms of actual numbers, but I'm just giving you an idea what they, they do. Then you've got something like a, a waterfall shot like this one, where we're talking about a long, slow, low shutter speed. And in this particular case, it's a half a second, not a thousandth of a second like the last one. I should also mention, just for those of you who really have um, come to this very, very fresh, is that those numbers on the dial on the top are fractions of a second. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a convention, and you'll see that the, the, the whole numbers, I'll just come back to my previous 
image just to make this point, which I didn't put in my notes and it just occurred to me as I was saying it, is if I can move my mouse onto the screen, you'll see one, two, four, eight. Those are simple numbers, that's all. Those are all the fractions. So that's faster and faster and faster, shorter and shorter, shorter, up to four thousandth a fraction of a second. But the other direction, you see it says 2s, 4s, 8s, that's eight seconds four seconds. So that's getting longer and longer and longer. And they're whole seconds, not fractions of a second. Some cameras in the viewfinder will have the number with a little tiny, like a, 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 a what do you call it? A, a parenthesis, not parentheses. Um, <laughs> I can't think of the name for them. Um, inverted commas next to it. And that means more than one second in whole seconds. Whereas the number on its own will be the fractions of a second. So if you see a two, with the little apostrophe on it, that's two seconds. But if you see a two without anything, that's a half a second. And it's just to make it easier for the camera to display those numbers rather than having to have one with a slash and a two or something like that. So those are little conventions. All right, back to, back to there. Okay, so a thousandth of a second, those water droplets are moving fast. They're you know all over the place as, as the boat goes through the wave. So a short, high, fast shutter speed freezes movement. Now you may ask, well, exactly how short does a shutter speed have to be to freeze the movement? Because does not that depend to a great extent on how fast the object is moving? Well, I'm gonna come back to that point when we talk a bit in a bit more detail about this because it's a very, very important thing to establish. Then we've got really long exposures. This is 60 seconds. This is Sugarloaf Rock over in uh, Western Australia. Um, and this was taken um, using a special filter, which reduces the amount of light that comes into the camera, even though it's actually daylight. And it forces the camera into a very long um, exposure, 60 seconds. And during that 60 seconds, the clouds have moved, the water has moved randomly and all of the surging surf around the rocks has formed a kind of white foam because everything in there has been moving during that 60 seconds. And that's how you get that effect. That's an extremely long exposure. Okay. Now don't forget, and I'm just going to make sure that I'm not missing anything here. Um, please do feel free to put comments in the, uh, the chat. That's easier for me to see. Uh, there is an ask a question section at the bottom of the screen, but the, the chat's probably a good place for it. So if something crops up when I'm talking, just put it in the chat and I'll, I'll try and cycle back to it and, and explain a little bit more about it. Or I'll do it at the end, depending on how much detail I need to go into. Right, uh, that's long exposures. So just a little summary before we move on. Shutter speeds control the capture of move, movement, motion. And there's two sorts of motion. But most importantly, if there is no motion, and this is something to remember, if there is no motion of anything whatsoever, the shutter speed is irrelevant to the look of the image, completely and utterly irrelevant. Now that didn't used to be the case back in film days because long exposures cause problems with the film sensitivity. But digital sensors, you can do fast, short exposures, whatever you like, but if there's nothing moving, the shutter speed makes no difference at all. Very, very important. Now, there's two sorts of motion that we have to be concerned about. The first one is the obvious one. It's the subject movement. And the second one is less obvious, but it's absolutely critical. That's camera motion. The camera is not stable if you're hand holding it, and we need to take that into account as well. And I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest single rookie errors that I see when I'm teaching beginners out in the field, when I used to do that <laughs> before we all got shut down, was blurred photographs not due to the subject movement, but because the camera was wobbling. And I'll talk more about that in a sec. So um, let's talk about camera motion first. That's the, that's, that's probably the, it's not a creative thing. I suppose it could be, I mean, you could actually move the camera deliberately to get some blurry effect, but that's like really advanced. What we're trying to achieve is a sharp photograph of something that at this point, let's just assume that the subject is not moving. So we're separating out these concepts. We've got static subject and we've got a camera that is not on a tripod. Otherwise it would be static too and the shutter speed wouldn't make any difference, of course. Um, 
let's just drill into that a little bit more. So here's, here's an example of an extreme camera movement situation. This is photographing out of the window of a light aeroplane. Um, the subject is moving very, very slowly because the plane is actually on an angle circling the subject. So you're looking straight out the window, not down, you're looking straight out the window to the ground because the plane is steeply banked and circling. That means that what's coming, what's in front of your eyes is just slowly rotating like this, not very quick at all. It's a combine harvest, it's not moving very quickly. But what is moving quickly is me. The wind buffeting in that window is making the camera jounce around and it's really, really hard to hold it still. This is where your shutter speed needs to be set such that it's fast enough to freeze the movement of the camera itself. Otherwise, you're just gonna get a blurry picture. It doesn't matter about the focus, about the aperture, about the eyes or anything. That image will be blurry because the camera is blurry. That's a very, very important point to remember because um, when you're out photographing a nice landscape picture like this, for instance, let's say you were uh, bushwalking and you didn't take a tripod with you. And I always recommend you do take a tripod, but obviously there's situations where you might not. And this is dawn at Mount Warning. So that's the first rays of sunshine hitting the, uh, the east coast of Australia. And I was using the SL2 and um, got the wrong lens on at the moment, that doesn't matter. But if you're hand holding this, you need to know what shutter speed you should be using to get a sharp image. Now I'm assuming at this point, no stabilizers, nothing, just simple lens and camera. And there is a rule of thumb, which is worth remembering. And I'm sure some of you, and I know from looking at the names on of our participants, that there are plenty of people who are, have done this sort of thing before and have actually heard me say this before as well. But for those of you who haven't, there is a rule of thumb. Now then, if you are using, let's say a 50 millimeter lens, on a full frame camera. Um, that is a magnification of approximately one. So the subject looks the same distance in real life as it does in the photograph. That's effectively what a standard lens gives you. In that circumstance, your minimum shutter speed for hand holding safely and easily would be at least that same number, 50, but in fractions of a second and preferably double that okay, just to be safe, because these are high resolution sensors and they will record the slightest bit of movement uh, in the camera at higher fidelity. Therefore, when you enlarge it more, you'll see that blur more clearly. So high quality, modern sensor, the, the focal length of your lens expressed as a fraction of a second should be the beginning of your danger zone. Above that, so with the 50 mil lens, shooting at 125th of a second, piece of cake, just you can do that fairly casually. Thousandth of a second, effortless. But once you get to a thirtieth of a second, like one stop below, or a fifteenth of a second, or an eighth of a second, you start to run into the problem of you simply cannot hold that camera still enough and you will get a wobbly picture. Now, this is obviously modified by the fact that we have stabilizers, the SL2 and the SL2S has a really good stabilizer on the sensor itself. And some of the lenses, um, this one here, this is the 24 to 90 for the SL. Uh, this has a stabilizer built into it too. So between them, they do a pretty good job. So you can sometimes get away with much, much lower shutter speeds. And in fact, this shot here uh, was handheld at half a second because I'm taking care of the shot and I've got a stabilizer in the camera and I would talk, in fact, I think I had my elbows resting on a, um, a railing, which helps you do whatever you need to do to stay stable in these circumstances. Um, so here's me hand holding the same camera. This is not actually in New South Wales. This is in Africa. It was a, one of the very few pictures of me actually doing anything. Mostly it's me taking the pictures of other people. So if you look at this picture, I want you to just look at how I'm holding the camera. And I'm just gonna demonstrate. So let me just come back to my main screen for a sec. There we go. I'll come back to that image in a minute because it's really important to show you how to have to hold the camera. It sounds really basic, but for one thing is, one thing, really don't hold the camera like this, okay? That means that this arm here 
is taking all of the weight. Okay, that's okay up to a point. And definitely don't hold the camera where all of the weight is on this hand and you do this. Okay, because this means that all of the weight is on this hand and I have to grip the camera reasonably tightly. And that means the more, have you ever noticed that the, the tighter you grip something, the more you get the shimmies slightly? What you want to be doing is making a stable position that's not clenched. So, as in the picture, left hand supports the weight. Elbow is tucked in here. And then this hand only needs to lightly touch the controls. Very, very lightly. I am not squeezing at all with this hand. Okay. That means I can operate the controls without having to clench these bottom three fingers. That's really, really important. I can operate the dial and most importantly, I can squeeze that shutter button really gently. And that is another critical part of it. So I'll just come back to my, uh, into there. And next picture, you can see in this picture, I'm holding it nice and gently. I'm actually holding the camera with my fingers up because it's a cue and it's, it, it, there's no real lens to really get hold of. So I'm still supporting it here, but my fingers are nice and light on the, on the shutter button and on the dials. And what I'm doing is I am taking up the first pressure on the shutter button at the point where it triggers the meter. And then past that point, I am simply, if there is such a thing as a muscle in the end of my finger, I'm just twitching it ever so slightly. And you should be able to take a picture, come back to me so you can see what I'm doing. You should be able to take a picture where you can't see your finger move, like really gentle. You need to practice this. Try and take a picture where you can hear the camera trigger, but you can't see the finger move. And if we were in a face-to-face -face workshop, I'd be going around the desk and showing you, and I can press this button and you can't see my finger move. If you can't see my finger move, the camera's not being moved and you're gonna get a steady shot. So seriously, squeeze really gently, support the camera properly, and don't stress this hand out. And you'll find that that is a nice, stable position to shoot in, okay? All right, come back to PowerPoint. So that's very, very important. Squeeze, don't jab, absolutely critical. So static subject, high res frame, full frame camera with no stabilizer. The safety zone is a focal length of the lens times two and above, as in shorter or faster. The danger zone is below that. And you have to practice yourself because some people are really good at holding still and some people are terrible at it. And uh, the other thing I should point, mention, so if you can see my picture in the little um, the bottom right hand side of the screen is, is this, come back to my camera so you can see me. This is unstable, looking at the rear screen, okay? That is not a stable position. And I, I've seen some videos recently of people doing fashion photography workshops where the leader of the workshop is shooting all of the pictures of the model like this, and he's focusing on the back screen here. Now, for a DSLR, maybe that's a good idea because obviously you haven't got a, a live viewfinder, but with an electronic viewfinder, you should be using the viewfinder, holding it so that it, it's touching your eyebrow. And you've got a nice stable position. This is not stable. Don't do that. I suppose if you had to hold the camera really high or whatever, you had a tilting screen, that might be a good idea, but, but generally, no. Okay, so back to, uh, where was the next thing? Um, so shutter speeds control the capture of motion. We've talked about um, camera motion. Now we've got to talk about subject motion. So high shutter speeds, short, fast, high. I would say a short, fast, high shutter speed. And those words are interchangeable. Um, you'll find photographers use these you know, words interchangeably and it can be confusing for beginners, I know. But a 500th of a second, some people would say a 250th or above is fast enough to freeze most normal movement, okay? That would be what I would call a short, fast, high shutter speed. So something like this, um, this is off the Kimberley coast. This is where you would want a high shutter speed. And in fact, for this sort of shot, you want the highest shutter speed that's possible with the light levels, the ISO and the aperture that your camera offers you. So this is where you use the widest aperture on the lens and you would use an ISO sufficient to give you a shutter speed of at least, in this case, a thousandth of a second, maybe two thousandths. And 
When I say maybe, this tends to come with experience. If you do an eight thousandth, it's guaranteed to be sharp, but sometimes it's overkill because to get an eight thousandth of a second, you might have to take your ISO up and get a slightly noisy picture. So you, all of these things get balanced and prioritized, okay? Bird photography, obviously classically important to get the shot sharp, really, really important. Um, birds move randomly and quickly. And I wanna just point out that this sort of image is very, very much dependent on the distance of the bird from the camera. Same with a picture like this. These are small objects. Now, the first one was an albatross, uh, not an albatross, it was a petrel. I think it was a petrel. I'm not real good on birds, believe me, but I know that these are corellas and they are fast moving and they're quite close in this case. There's this thing called relative movement. And this is actually more accurate than just speed because something that's moving really fast, but it's a long way away, is only creeping along through your viewfinder. So if you imagine a horse that's a kilometer away, galloping across a field, you'll just see the horse just moving really, really slowly through the viewfinder. But if that horse is galloping 100 yards away from you, it'll seem to be going, and the maths defeats me, but let's say 10 times faster, it'll go across the viewfinder. Or and you'll, you know, you'll, be, you'll be have difficulty even following it but the horse speed hasn't changed. So you have to take that into account. So the first shot, you might find the horse a long way away, running at full speed, a 250th of a second, 125th might work. But with the horse much closer running across the camera, you might need a 4,000th of a second to freeze it, okay? Also, things moving fast towards you aren't moving left or right or up or down. They're moving towards you, they're just getting bigger so again, a, a slower shutter speed will keep it sharp. And you obviously have a focusing problem there, but it's about how quickly the object is moving through your viewfinder. It's not about how fast the object is moving in terms of kilometers per hour. It's about how fast it's moving through your viewfinder. And you'll need to judge this as you um, do different sorts of photography. Uh, birds, obviously, you wanna be prioritizing shutter speed when they're in flight. Um, Rodeo, same thing. Now he's coming towards me. So the shutter speed of the, the fast horse um, movement towards me isn't so important. But the fact that he's toppling off his horse to wrestle the cow to the ground, that's important. That's quite a fast movement. So this one is taken at about a 500th of a second and it's pretty sharp. That was on the CL, I took that one. And now this was taken on the Noctilux 75 on the SL, and that was taken at about a 4,000th of a second at f1.25. So that's because I was showing how well the lens works at f1.25. So my shutter speed was really, really high and probably higher than I needed, to, needed it to be. But he's moving pretty quickly. I mean, he's hitting the dirt real hard. So again, shutter speed freezes that movement. That's what high shutter speeds do. Okay, um, low shutter speeds. Now this is one of my favorite techniques is actually not trying to fight movement, which is what freezing it does. So you're trying to show something frozen in action. And that's a whole different ball game to showing the effects of the movement. So show, trying to capture the sense of movement of the subject, which means that you're not freezing it the opposite freezing it is blurring it and that's what you're doing when you're using long shutter speeds you're deliberately capturing some blur so to give you an example these two uh, images are taken at different shutter speeds this is dorigo national park um, and one of them is about a 250th that's on the left and the one on the right is at about a 30th of a second not that slow but those water drops are relatively close and they are moving quite quickly. So you get them depicted at lines. And that's the key thing. A dot that's captured using a slow shutter speed will become a line. And if you've got lots of dots, you get lots of lines and that's how you get those waterfall pictures with the water all feathery and smooth, you see. So to give you an example, there is one second, one eighth of a second and one 250th of a second. 
but everything else is the same. And if I enlarge those up a little bit to show you a bit more detail, you'll see this, that's a 250th. That's fast enough to freeze the movement of the water almost completely. If you look really closely, you'd see a little bit of blue on the splashy bits, okay? When you go to that middle shutter speed, and you see how it's gone kind of a little bit sharp, a little bit blurred. It's a mixture of the two. I find that quite satisfying. I find that that shows the movement of the water in a more pleasing way than, for instance, this one, which is where it's gone all smooth. And that choice is a creative choice. It may be you want to sharp, make the water sharp. It may be you want it to be half sharp, half blurred, or maybe you want it to be completely smooth like this shot. That's your creative choice, but it gives you an idea of how the different shutter speeds gives you a very, very different result. Okay. This is using that same technique to creative effect. This is um, motorcycle traffic in Vietnam, and this was shot at a quarter of a second. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually shooting and I'm following the movement of that bike in the middle. That means, now remember what I said about relative movement. If you follow a moving subject and you try to keep that subject relatively still in the middle of the frame, you can use a much lower shutter speed than, you, than if you were holding the camera statically and letting things whiz past you. And it also means that outside on the edges of the frame, you get these interesting blurs and anything behind the subject, which of course is moving relative to the subject, will be a bit more blurry as well. This is a panning technique. And you can use it for sport or anything where something is moving against a background. It involves following it and it's very hit and miss. I have to tell you, I've been doing this a long time and even now it's really difficult to judge the shutter speed that works best and get the actual technique right. You have to shoot a lot of pictures, but then you get a, a, a pleasing one and I think this one worked quite well. So that's using a low shutter speed to capture the sense of hustle and bustle in this busy city. Very long exposures. This is Sean Cliff Pier in Queensland. This is somewhere, this is 120 seconds on the SL2. Uh, that again, using a, a strong ND filter. And even the clouds have moved in this exposure. And of course the water, whilst in reality, it's moving up and down in 120 seconds, those, uh, the exposure of the water tends to average out. And that's why you get that smooth effect. So you've got as many pixels that are where the water's up as, as where they are down, and it tends to average out to this smooth kind of foggy effect. And some people don't like this look, some people love it, but it's just another string to your bow when it comes to photographic techniques. This is Morton Island off the coast of Brisbane again, same thing, long exposure, but not so long that the clouds have blurred. So the clouds, which are obviously moving very slowly, have not blurred, but the water has, and I find that a nice, interesting combination. I use that strong ND filter quite a lot, actually. Now, here's a, an interesting combination of the two, a little bit like the motorcycle shot. When I first got the SL2, this one here, this was the first time that a Leica camera had a built-in stabilizer. And I think I got my camera about a week before I left to go to Myanmar with a workshop. And so I was dying to try out it, it's, you know, how, see how effective it was. So this is a one quarter of a second exposure, handheld standing up in a longboat. And can you see how the driver is sharp, but the water is not? That's because the driver is relatively static in the, the frame, and my stabilizer is able to cope with that. But the water whizzing through the frame has blurred to give that sense of speed. And I, I found this gives quite a, a nice impression of what it's like to be in a longboat on uh, Inlay Lake, as it turns out. So again, I'm mixing up the two different techniques here. I'm freezing one subject, but I'm blurring another. And that's part of the sort of playing around the creative use of shutter speeds. Classic waterfall picture. Uh, I shot this very recently for a, a video I'm working on at the moment. And you can see how the water has got that nice smooth effect. And that's half a second um, effect. And then this last one here, this is just being a bit crazy with the shutter speeds. This is a, a, a telephoto shot of a wave with the sun behind it just breaking. And I've shot this at half a second and I did it just to see what happened. And I found the result 
reasonably pleasing. Maybe there's a bit too dark in that bottom left hand corner, but as an example of, of how you can have fun with shutter speeds and hey, pixels are free, so just experiment, have a bit of a play with it, see what you get. And then this was another image that I shot of actually very, very recently um, where we were, I was, <laughs> what I was trying to do, and I, I don't want to give away the story too much because I'm going to do a little bit video about it, but I was actually trying to revisit a location um, where I'd got one of my favorite photographs um, from quite a few, few years ago, like 20 years ago. I have it as a six foot by three foot print on the wall of my living room and it's got a really dramatic sky. And I, I went back to the same location to see if I could get to reimagine, not the same shot, but get another image. And, and as it turns out, I did not do a very good job because the weather was against me. But I came up with this image, which I really liked. It's taken nearby. So one of the lessons from that experience was it's all very well going to look for a specific image, but sometimes it's not possible when you get there for whatever reason. But just because you can't get that one image you got in your head, doesn't mean you can't get something else equally interesting. And this is me using my strong ND filter again, um, taken on the 24 to 90 at 90 millimeters, and that's eight seconds using the strong ND filter. And what you can see here, which you could not see in real life, is the shadows cast by the rocks here and here, because the sun was rising up to the left or the high left if you like but on the horizon and it was casting shadows but because the water was moving around there was no way you could actually see that with the naked eye but the accumulation of the different shadows and highlights over eight seconds reveals things that actually don't show up to the naked eye a great example of that, and I don't have an image here to show you, is cityscapes at night across water, like Sydney Harbour at night or anything like that. And you know how you get, if the water's a little bit choppy, you get all those dancing highlights. But that's because your eye is working at about a quarter of a second, an eighth of a second. It kind of has a shutter speed in a manner of speaking. And you're seeing all these dancing highlights as time passes. Now, one's perception of time, of course, is a tricky philosophical question, but I think you, you can imagine what I'm talking about. There's still dancing highlights. But if you do a long exposure, let's say 15 seconds, all of those highlights that your eye sees during that 15 seconds are all captured in one image. So it's all of those highlights at the same time. And basically those colored highlights become this much stronger swathe of color through the water. And it can look really effective. You can, it can be too much, it may be uh, depending on your taste, um, but it's definitely something worth thinking about because when you're doing these very long exposures, you're accumulating the image across time. So as things change, they continue to draw themselves in your image. And that's why the long exposure technique can be so creative. Freezing images is freezing fast moving images is relatively easy, but getting the right balance of long exposures compared to the amount of things, sorry, the speed that things are moving is a little bit tricky, a little bit hit and miss. Um, so something worth experimenting with. Okay, so I'm going to, I've pretty much summing up here. Um, I'd love to hear some questions from people. Um, I'm just gonna sum up with that the shutter speeds control the time for which light enters the lens. That's the duration of the exposure. But the, as far as the effect on the picture is concerned, it captures both subject movement and camera movement. And it's that second part, the camera movement, that really defeats people quite frequently. Because, and I'll just gonna, I'll come back to that point in a sec when I've just finished off these little points here. So shutter speeds are only important when something is moving, you, camera, or both. I mean, aerial photography of something moving would count like that. Um, but again, if nothing is moving, then the shutter speed has precisely zero effect on the look of the image. Now, if you've got the camera on a tripod, and you're photographing an interior of a building and there's no people in it and there's nothing moving at all, the shutter speed is completely out of the equation and all it does is help you control the exposure itself. But it doesn't affect the look of the picture. Whether it's one second or a hundred seconds, it won't make any difference at all. And then 
that's the last point I want to make. And I want to come back to just one little thing. I'm just going to turn my camera back on now. And that was to do with this. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning this rookie error of getting unsharp pictures because the shutter speed was too low. And there's a really there's a real gotcha in that. And I, I can actually explain it a little bit better if I use the example of the 24 to 90 millimeter lens, which I will put on. OK, now, if you've got an SL2 or something similar, you may know that some of these zoom lenses are, in fact, have they have variable maximum apertures. So this is at 24 millimeters. This is an f 2.8 lens. At 90 millimeters, it's an f4 lens. So if you zoom from wide to telephoto from 24 to 90, your shutter speed will, of course, drop by one step because you've gone from 2.8. So you've, basically the aperture is closed in real terms from 2.8 to four, which means your shutter speed needs to be slightly longer to compensate for that darkness. So it's, it's darkened by one stop. Your shutter speed therefore needs to be one stop slower to allow the light in for twice as long to compensate for that. And we'll talk more about exposures in another video. But the other thing is, and so let me just backtrack slightly. So if your exposure at 24 millimeters was using my rule of thumb, let's say you were playing safe at a 50th of a second or 60th of a second, it's a nice round figure, 60th of a second, very safe at 24 mil. But if you zoom, in the, nothing else is changing, same lighting conditions. If you zoom into 90 millimeters, okay, that 60th of a second will change to a 30th of a second, but you're using a 90 millimeter lens and your safe zone would be, let's say 125th to 250th. So your shutter speed is now way lower than it should be. Thing here is you may not notice and that's where the error comes in. Okay, so my advice to for something to take away, I suppose, from this evening is always check your shutter speed, particularly when you're shooting on um, aperture priority, shot, um, uh, camera program, uh, program mode, aperture priority, exposure mode, and particularly when you're shooting with zoom lenses. Because don't forget, when you zoom in, it magnifies any wobble. And that's why you need to have the shutter speed a little bit higher. Because if you magnify the wobble from with a, let's say, a 50 mil to a 100 mil lens, that will double the same amount of wobble in, inherent in your stance. That's why you've got to have the shutter, shutter, higher shutter speed. So if you combine that with a darkening of the exposure because the aperture's changed, you've got a double whammy there. And that really catches out a lot of people. It really does. So it's something to be aware of. So always keep an eye on that shutter speed. No matter what you're doing, you should know the shutter speed that you're using at any one moment. And you need to be keeping it in mind so that you can judge whether it is in fact the appropriate shutter speed for whatever it is you're shooting at that time. So you, you keep an eye on the shutter speed in the viewfinder at all times, and then you will not have image failures due to camera shake, just camera shake. Obviously it's a different story when you're talking about subject movement. That's a different calculation because you need to set a high shutter speed or whatever, or low shutter speed for subject movement. Okay, so can you see how they're like different concepts? They both require an awareness of your shutter speed, but the, the, the shutter speed you need to set for hand holding is a different thought process to the shutter speed you might choose for, for creative effect. For instance, those long exposures I just showed you, they have to be shot on a tripod because anything below, let's say quarter of a second, an eighth of a second is gonna get very, very difficult to hand hold no matter how careful you are once you get to a longer exposure than that, that's when the tripod comes into play. All right, so questions. Um, what type of filter was used to reduce the light entering the camera in the rock shot? Um, I don't have one, actually it's in the other room. It's a straightforward ND400 filter. That means that it reduces the light by about nine or 10 stops. ND400, I think that's right. But you can get them anywhere. 
uh, any of the uh, any of the camera retailers will sell them. Uh, Leica don't make one that strong. We do an ND16, I think, which is four stops. But there's um, this ND400. Basically, if you if you look at it and you look try and look through it, you won't be able to see anything through it. It's like looking through. It's like the the glass that you used to get in old welding masks. Um, smoked glass or, or for looking at the sun for like solar eclipses. It's so dark that you can barely see through it. Amazingly, the electronic viewfinder in the SL2 and the SL2S is completely capable of still showing you the, the image, so they're dead easy to use. But that's all it was. It's it's one of two filters I use, polarizer and ND filter. Those are the only two I ever use, and I use it a lot, the ND filter. Um, Tony asks, Nick, best general speed for street photography? That's a very good question, and Jesse Marlow has a lot to say on this subject, um, as do other street photographers. But from what I gather, uh, Craig Semetko says the same, uh, Alan Schaller says the same. What they're doing is going for high shutter speeds all the time, like 500 minimum. Because what they want is a sharp image irrespective of what's going on. They want to freeze whatever's going on all the time, and they will do whatever it takes to get that. Now, that's just the way some street photographers work. You may want to capture the hustle and bustle and use a longer shutter speed, a slower shutter speed, but that's kind of not street photography. That's heading more into documentary, even art photography. For street photography, as it's understood by me, it's about juxtapositions of, of things, um, maybe some visual humor or incongruous um, uh, colors matching, like the one of Jesse's pictures has got a, a check a chessboard on the ground and guys holding a book and Jesse's lined it up so the square of the book makes an extra square so that's street photography but you don't want to be worrying about blurred pictures so they tend to set their cameras to um, shutter priority and auto ISO making sure is that right yeah uh, making sure that their shutter speed never goes below a 500th of a second or even a thousandth and the ISO is irrelevant because it's not about um, you know, grain free pictures. It's about capturing that moment. So high shutter speeds are a really good idea. You'll have to do one of Jesse's workshops and he'll go into that in more detail. Um, John. Hey, John. John Mamatil. Thanks, Nick. What are your thoughts on variable ND filters or do you feel they degrade the image, but they are convenient, I guess? OK, yes. Very good point. V variable ND filters are essentially two polarizing filters screwed together. And as you turn them, they let less or more light through. It's like if you've got Polaroid spectacles um, and, you, and you put them in front of each other, two pairs, and cross them over, you'll see them go dark or light. That's what it's doing. The problem is that when you move it to its darkest setting and you use a, a wide angle lens, and not that wide, maybe 28, 24 millimeter lens, you get this bizarre cross darkening in the picture. It's like a big cross through the picture. Um, it's not vignetting. It's, it's like, if you imagine the corners are in the middle, <laughs> so the vignetting is in the middle and it's lighter on the edges. It's the most peculiar effect. And that is worse the stronger you turn it. So variable ND filters are actually designed for use with video far more commonly because video, ver video um, proper serious videographers very, very rarely use wide angle lenses in, in videography. They're more likely to do um, 50 mil, 100 millimeter or longer lenses and then do a series of shots to capture an expanse rather than a big wide angle vista. So they use the ND filters to control the exposure. OK, so you can just dial in the exposure and you keep the shutter speed at a 50th of a second or something, which is for completely different reasons to what we're talking about. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Maybe another video and another webinar about that. Um, once you start using variable NDs for stills and you're going into the slightly wider end of the lens at range, then you will come, against, uh, come into problems. So I don't recommend them for stills, um, but for video, they're fantastic. Um, yeah. Okay, um, anybody else got any questions? Um, because it's, uh, it's oh, we, we, we're doing well, we're doing well. I, I like to wrap these things up in an hour and we've got 10 minutes to go. So if anybody's got any questions, I'm very happy to uh, to answer them. Um, anybody coming in there? So, all right, okay. I think that's all the questions. I'm going to uh, call it quits, um, I think. Uh, yep. Okay. So thank you so much for 
uh, attending this evening. It's good to see some familiar names out there. This again is a regular series that we'll be doing. Uh, next, the next one um, I believe is on depth of field. Um, I've got two more coming up. I can't remember which way round I've got them, but it's it's on the Crowdcast channel, uh, like Academy Crowdcast channel. So hopefully see you uh, see you there. And there's a question come in just as I was trying to wind things up. <laughs> Keith, uh, do you use an ND filter on an M camera? That's a good question because um, if you were using, for instance, uh, a Leica 50mm Noctilux, which is an F0.95 uh, f-stop, and you were shooting in full sunlight, the shutter speed will not go high enough to give you a correct exposure because a 4,000th, which is the high shutter speed, at 0.95 is about a stop, two stops overexposed. So if in that circumstance you were shooting in that way, you would need a two-stop ND filter so that your pictures aren't all overexposed. Now, if you're shooting with the Noctilux on the SL2, it goes up to much higher shutter speed, so it's not a problem. So, But you can absolutely use the ND filter the way I was, I was using it, the strong ND filter, on, on, a, on a, any camera. You can use it on a phone if you want to, if you can fit it on. So the, the print, all, all it does is reduce the light coming into the lens has nothing to do with the camera and lens itself. It's just reducing the light. It blocks and absorbs some of the light. So I've used my ND filter on my 18 millimeter Elmar on my M uh, a lot over the years. It's a bit difficult to fit on because the uh, the filter um, rings are non-standard. I've got it sort of bodged on with a bit of gaffer tape and some chewing gum. I don't know what it is, but it just is held in place. And it works absolutely fine. Same principles apply to what we've been talking about, okay? So go ahead. And Sandeep, um, to start with long exposures, which ND filter and how many stops would you recommend? Well, it's hard to know how many to recommend, but what I would definitely not do is go for a weak one. There's no point in a two, four, six stop one. You, you, those, expose, those shutter speeds or those exposure durations need to be four, eight, 15, 30 seconds long before you're going to get anything pleasing. I mean, anything like this, like a seascape, if you shot that at two seconds or four seconds, you're going to get this kind of halfway, not really blurred, not really sharp look, which is sometimes might be okay, but you're not going to get that beautifully smooth look. That needs to be 15, 30, 60 seconds. So if you were investing in a filter, I would just go with a really strong one straight up, nine, 10, 16 they do, that's maybe too much, but I, I would go with a 10 stop ND filter. And the other little thing I'll, I'll tell you um, is if you have a range of lenses with different uh, filter diameters, this is an 82, but if you have smaller lenses, buy the 82 millimeter filter and then buy a range of stepping rings so you can use the same filter on multiple lenses, save you a lot of money. Um, they, that's what I do, I've got one ND filter and I've got about a pile of stepping rings about this high to fit in all the different sizes. You can get them for very, very little money um, through pretty much anywhere. They're not expensive at all, okay? Um, Harry Watson says, thanks, Nick. Wish I had this three weeks ago. <laughs> all right, so look, thank you so much for listening. I hope that's clarified what shutter speeds are for and how to use them. Um, look forward to seeing some of you all of you hopefully in the next next month for the next webinar and so i'll say good evening for now <laughs>